I don't want to make you fellows nervous, began my uncle in a peculiarly impressive, not to say blood-curdling, tone of voice, and if you would rather that I did not mention it, I won't. But as a matter of fact, this very house in which we are now sitting is haunted. <laughs> you don't say that, exclaimed Mr. Coombs. What's the use of your saying I don't say that when I've just said it, retorted my uncle, somewhat annoyed. You talk so foolishly. I tell you, the house is haunted. Regularly on Christmas Eve, the blue chamber, they call the room next to the nursery, the blue chamber at my uncle's, is haunted by the ghost of a sinful man. A man who once killed a Christmas carol singer with a lump of coal. <laughs> How did he do it? asked Mr. Coombs eagerly. Was it difficult? I do not know how he did it, replied my uncle. He did not explain the process. The singer had taken up a position just under the front gate and was singing a ballad. It is presumed that when he opened his mouth for a B-flat, a lump of coal was thrown from the, by the sinful man from one of the upper windows and that it went down the singer's throat and choked him. You want to be a very good shot. <laughs> Certainly worth trying, murmured Mr. Coombs thoughtfully. But that was not his only crime, alas, added my uncle. Prior to that, he killed a solo cornet player. No, is that really a fact, exclaimed Mr. Coombs. Of course it's a fact, answered my uncle testily. At all events, as much of a fact as you can expect to get in a case of this sort. The poor fellow, the cornet player, had been in the neighborhood barely a month. Old Mr. Bishop, who kept the Jolly Sand Boys at the time, and from whom I had the story, said he had never known a more hard-working and energetic solo cornet player. He, the cornet player, only knew two tunes, but Mr. Bishop said that the man could not have played with more vigor or for more hours a day if he had known forty. The two tunes he did play were Annie Laurie and Home Sweet Home, and as regarded his performance of the former melody, Mr. Bishop said that a mere child could have guessed what he was trying to play. This musician, this poor friendless artist, used to come regularly and play in this, in this very street, just opposite, for two hours every evening. One evening he was seen, evidently in response to an invitation, going into this very house, but was never seen to come out of it again. <laughs> Did the townsfolk try offering any reward for his recovery? asked Mr. Coombs. Not a penny, replied my uncle. <laughs> Another summer, continued my uncle, a German band visited here, intending, so they announced on their arrival, to stay till the autumn. On the second day after their arrival, the whole company, as fine and healthy a body of men as one would wish to see, were invited to dinner by this sinful man, and after spending the whole of the next twenty-four hours in bed, left the town a broken and dyspeptic crew. The parish doctor who had attended them, giving it as his opinion that it was doubtful if they would, any of them, be fit to play an air ever again. You, you don't know the recipe, do you? asked Mr. Coombs. Unfortunately, I do not, replied my uncle. But the chief ingredient was said to have been railway dining room hash. I forget the man's other crimes, my uncle went on. I used to know them all at one time, but my memory is not what it was. I do not, however, believe I am doing his memory an injustice in believing that he was not entirely unconnected with the death and subsequent burial of a gentleman who used to play the harp with his toes, and that neither was he altogether unresponsible for the lonely grave of an unknown stranger who had once visited the neighborhood, an Italian peasant lad, as I remember, a performer upon the barrel organ. Every Christmas Eve, my uncle, cleaving with low, impressive tones the strange, odd silence that, like a shadow, seemed to have slowly stolen into and settled down upon the room. The ghost of this sinful man haunts the blue chamber in this very house. There, from midnight until cockcrow, amid wild muffled shrieks and groans and mocking laughter and ghostly sounds of horrid blows, it does fierce phantom fight with the spirits of the solo cornet player and the murdered carol singer, assisted at intervals by the shades of the German band, while the ghost of the strangled harpist plays mad, ghostly melodies with ghostly toes on the ghost of a broken harp. Uncle said the blue chamber was comparatively useless as a sleeping apartment on Christmas Eve. Hark, said my uncle, raising a warning hand towards the ceiling while we held our breath and listened. Hark, I believe they are at it now in the blue chamber. I rose up and said I would sleep. 
in the blue chamber. Never, cried my uncle, springing up. You shall not put yourself in this deadly peril. Besides, the bed is not made up. <laughs> Never mind the bed, I replied. I have lived in furnished apartments for gentlemen and have been accustomed to sleep on beds that have never been made up from one year's end to the next. I am young and have had a clear conscience now for at least a month. The spirits will not harm me. I may even do them some little good and induce them to be quiet and go away. Besides, I should like to see the show. They tried to dissuade me from what they termed my foolhardy enterprise, but I remained firm and claimed my privilege. I was the guest. The guest always sleeps in the haunted chamber on Christmas Eve. It is his right. They said that if I put on that footing, they had, of course, no answer, and they lighted a candle for me and followed me upstairs in a body. Whether elevated by the feeling that I was doing a noble action, or animated by a mere general consciousness of rectitude, is not for me to say, but I went upstairs that night with a remarkable buoyancy. It was as much as I could do to stop the landing when I came to it. I felt I wanted to go on up to the roof. But with the help of the banisters, I restrained their ambition, wished them all good night, and went in and shut the door. Things began to go wrong with me from the very first. The candle tumbled out of the candlestick before my hand was off the lock. It kept on tumbling out again. I never saw such a slippery candle. I gave up attempting to use the candlestick at last and carried the candle about in my hand. And even then it would not keep upright. So I got wild and threw it out the window and undressed and went to bed in the dark. I did not go to sleep. I did not feel sleepy at all. I lay on my back looking up at the ceiling and thinking of things. I wish I could remember some of the ideas that came to me as I lay there because they were so amusing. 